Okay, we are recording. So welcome back everyone. Just a few logistics. Um, please note that we're recording the tour and we'll post a link on the Berkeley Path Wanderers Association website and include it in the next newsletter. And we'll hopefully have time for questions at the end. Um, you can use the Q&A function at the bottom of, your, bottom of your screen to post any questions or use the raise your hand function. And I do know how that works now. <laughs> so um, let's see, I'm Janet Byron, a current board member of Berkeley Path Wanderers Association and the newsletter editor, as Alina said. I was also on the second board of the Path Wanderers in the early 2000s, working on the newsletter then too. I'm the co-author of Berkeley Walks with my good friend, Bob Johnson. And I met Tina signing books at the Berkeley Historical Society booth um, at the book festival a few years ago. I've lived in West Berkeley on Alston Way since 1997 and in Berkeley since 1989. Um, my daughter is a senior at Berkeley High and my husband, Steve Price, is actually in the hospital right now <laughs> following heart surgery. So I may drop off the tour if I get a call. So just giving you a heads up on that. Hi, I'm Bob Johnson. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest and went to school at Washington University, St. Louis, um, and then spent three years in the Peace Corps and three, uh, 13 years, um, the, uh, three years in the Peace Corps in the Philippines and 13 years in Japan. Um, settling in Berkeley in 1985, and I began walking all around town and in the parks of the Bay Area um, and started leading walks with Green Bell Alliance, which is where I met Janet, and we did the book together. Hi, I'm Tina, and I was born in uh, Herrick Hospital in 1953, and I was brought up in South Berkeley. Uh, I went to neighborhood schools until I was a member of the first integrated class at Garfield Junior High, which is now King. I graduated from the University of Texas at Austin. I married my high school sweetheart, we're still married, and we have two wonderful adult children. After uh, careers in high tech, I began writing about South Berkeley in the Julia Street series of books, and I started leading neighborhood walks in South Berkeley in 2000, 2016. Here's the map. Um, and you can see it's a map of South Berkeley, of the South Berkeley area that we'll be touring today. Before I was born, when my parents moved to Berkeley in 1943, South Berkeley, which was segregated by design as a result of redlining and gentlemen's agreements, among realtors, um, South Berkeley was the only area in Berkeley where people of color could live or buy property. My family's home is on Julia Street, just steps from Sacramento Street, and we'll go by there later. The black dot with the arrow is our starting point at the Ashby BART station. We'll be showing the map five more times during the tour so that you'll be able to orient yourselves. So let's go for a walk. Um, I've got my, my hat and my hiking boots, <laughs> water and sunscreen, and we're going to head out to the Ashby BART station, which was originally known as Newberry Station. And Bob will tell us a little bit more, more about the area's railroad history in a few minutes. Ashby Street and the Ashby Station are named after Mark Ashby, a farmer whose property was roughly between Shattuck, Ashby, MLK, Junior Way, and Woolsey Streets. Well, on the left, you see a picture of Mabel Mama Howard. She was a South Berkeley community activist who in the 1960s fought against proposed, a proposed above ground BART station that would have divided the community. She filed the lawsuit that eventually forced BART to move the line underground here. In 2018, the Berkeley City Council approved a petition to rename the Ashby BART in her honor. And that's now with the BART board. 
for review. I don't know what the status is. Um, so the Ashby flea market, which is on the lower right, has been operating on the east parking lots of the BART station since 1973, although its future is uncertain due to financial struggles and a new effort to build housing on the BART parking lot. On the west side of Adeline is the Ed Roberts campus, which is built directly up the, above the BART station on a former parking lot. Um, and although some parking still remains behind the building, Ed Roberts was a disability rights activist who was the first severely disabled person to attend UC Berkeley. And he was one of the founders of the Center for Independent Living in Berkeley. The Ed Roberts campus is a nonprofit organization that opened in 2012 and it houses several organizations that advocate for people with disabilities. We start by walking north along Adeline to the corner with Ashby. In 1876, a steam train line was extended from Oakland up Adeline and then Shattuck to downtown Berkeley. There were stops at Alcatraz called Lawrence Station, uh, Ashby called Newberry Station and Dwight all of which saw commercial areas grow up around the stops. Starting around 1903, there were also streetcar and commuter train lines, which connected to Bay, uh, Trans Bay Ferries. Uh, one of the start historic cars is pictured here and you'll notice it's labeled Lauren. We see here some of the historic buildings that remain around the corner of Adeline and Ashby, although many homes and other buildings were demolished to make way for the BART station and its parking lots. The picture on the upper left on the northwest corner of the Ashby Adeline intersection is the Webb Block, a mission revival building with a distinctive curving facade. Built in 1905 and designed by Charles W. McCall, it is a designated city landmark. It also houses the pharmacy, of, also housed the pharmacy of Thomas Caldecott, a Berkeley City Council member county supervisor and a key figure in the construction of the Highway 24 tunnel to Orinda, which is named for him. The lower right picture shows a block of historic stores, catty corner from the web block. Now let's cross Aspie and head north on the left side of Adeline, a few steps to the Laces store, which dates back to 1965. In 2004, it was merged with the Hughes collection of Keita and Jules Cliot become, be, to become the Laces Museum of Lace and Textiles. There are specimens from pre-Columbian Peru, 17th century European courts, industrial revolution, machine laces, and so on. Moving on toward the corner of Russell Street, we see the new bike lanes. Berkeley has been expanding what are called complete streets, which include sidewalks, and dedicated bike lanes. Here we see the bike lanes between the sidewalk and the parked cars. Um, this is considered uh, safer for cyclists than just a striped uh, area next to the parked cars at the curb. Similar protected bike lanes are being made on Hearst, Bancroft, Sacramento, and other locations around town. Now we turn left on Russell, and on the right side is the Berkeley Zen Center in the rear behind the residence at 1929 Russell. It was founded in 1967 and has been at this site since 1979, offering instruction in Zen or seated meditation, retreats, and other programs, but now online only during the COVID-19 pandemic. Just beyond the Zen temple, are a couple of residences converted to a Thai Buddhist temple called Wat Mankaratanaram with colorful carved ornamentation. During normal times, many UC Thai students and Thai Americans attend the temple and they offer a popular open air Sunday brunch to raise money for youth programs and charitable causes. Also closed now due to COVID. As an aside, about 30 years ago, my younger brother, who is multifaceted, um, I have to admit, and a bicoastal jazz musician and a proud graduate of Berkeley High and their renowned jazz program, 
um, at this at this temple, um, he took instruction and became a Buddhist monk. We attended the ordination and it was quite lovely. And we were all delighted with it. Although they spoke so softly, we heard little of what they said, but he was delighted and we were delighted for him. <laughs> Now let's continue a few steps toward the end of Russell at Martin Luther King Boulevard. The Berkeley South Branch Library was torn down and rebuilt in 2015. It was subsequently renamed the Terea Hall Pittman Branch as a result of a community petition. Pittman was a civil rights leader who served as president of the California State Association of Colored Women, Women's Clubs and the California Council of Negro Women between the 1930s and the 1950s. And she was director of the West Coast region of the NAACP from 1961 to 1965. She organized protests to force Kaiser shipyards to hire African-Americans during World War II helped desegregate the Oakland Fire Department in 1952 and lobbied successfully for the California Fair Employment Practices Act in 1959. And for many years, she hosted a radio program called Negroes in the News. Now we're gonna turn left on Martin Luther King Jr. Way on the way back toward BART. Uh, across the street at 2930 MLK Jr. Way was the former home of Terea Hall Pittman and her husband, William Pittman, who was a dentist. And it does look like the building is still a dental office. So now we arrive on the corner of MLK and Ashby. We've done a little loop around the block and we see the Ashby Stage, which is the home of Shotgun Players, a theater group that was formed in 1992 by Patrick Dooley in the Laval's Pizza on Euclid Avenue near the campus. They performed at 44 different spaces before, before finding this permanent space in 2004. And I've seen some wonderful shows there. They specialize in original historical musicals. And uh, that's my husband, Steve, standing there in the front. So we cross Caddy Corner over Ashby and MLK Jr. Way and pause to look across the street to the mural along the store wall of Ashby Market, which features local scenes and people such as Mr. Charles, and you can see him on the left, um, he's the man who waved to motorists for 30 years, exactly. It was October 6, 1962 to October 6, 1992, um, from in front of his home at Oregon Street and MLK Jr. Way, which is a couple of blocks back toward the library, past the library. So now we'll uh, continue down Ashby to Harper Street and turn left and stop in front of 3019 Harper. So on the map, you can see that um, the black dot, it's really small for me, <laughs> but the black dot is where we started. And if you follow the blue line, that's where we've came and where we've arrived at on Harper Street. We're now at 3019 Harper. Uh, which is the former home of internationally known gospel singer Tremaine Hawkins, formerly Tremaine Davis. And as an aside, her mother, Lois Davis, um, is otherwise known as Lois the Pie Queen. We'll talk a little bit about her later. Tremaine was a proud Berkeley High School graduate who began her successful career as a gospel singer in 1966 when she was 17 and began singing at the Ephesian Church of God in Christ in Berkeley when she was very young, um, which we'll see soon. Her rendition of Going Up Yonder is a standard at African-American homegoing services. Notably, she sang at the 2005 homegoing of Miss Rosa Parks. She has won two Grammy Awards. As we walk along Harper, Notice how much cooler and quiet it is here than at MLK and Ashby. 
helped by the mature Chinese elm trees lining the street with their tiny leaves, curvy branches, and peeling multicolored trunks. And street trees are one of the features that really can make streets, the ambience so, so much better. And there are a lot of them in South Berkeley. Just a little farther on the opposite side of the street at 3026 Harper, you can't miss this exuberant collection of found object sculptures, mainly depicting dogs. Well, at Prince Street, we turn right and walk one short block to the Northwest corner with Ellis Street, the, Mal the Malcolm X School. When I started school in 1958, I attended Abraham Lincoln Elementary, which is now Malcolm X. At the time, it was a neighborhood school, which meant nearly 100% of the student body was Black. Just 10 years earlier, Miss Ruth Atty was the first Black teacher hired by the Berkeley Unified School District. She taught at Lincoln. In 1968, a full 14 years after Brown versus Board of Education, Berkeley fully integrated its schools by instituting two-way busing, which sent both black and white students across town. Lincoln School was renamed for Malcolm X in the 1970s. It's now an arts and academics magnet school with the motto, together we can. For an optional detour, we head right on Ellis towards Ashby. This mural was painted in mid-July on Ellis Street between Prince and Ashby on the street east of Malcolm X School. It was painted by South Berkeley community activists as a call for reparations for enslaved people for their descendants. We continue on Ellis Street to Ashby and turn right to see the mural at 1801 Ashby. In 2018, the Friends of Adeline enrolled local artists and community members to create a mural depicting the history of South Berkeley from the time of the Ohlone Indians through today. Among those featured are Byron Rumford, who was the first black pharmacist and went in Berkeley and went on to become an assemblyman, and Ron Dellums, who was a congressman for years and then became the mayor of Oakland. And I'm delighted to be included, surrounded by Betty Reed Soskin, who is um, 99 years old and the oldest park working park ranger um, in the nation. And she works at the Rosie the Riveter Center in Richmond. And um, there's also Belva Davis, who is a renowned TV journalist the mayor of Berkeley and the current president of the Berkeley NAACP. I'm also really thrilled that Julia Street, where I grew up and where my books are set on this mural is deemed one of 10 streets that are called the heart of South Berkeley. If we go along on Ashby to the other side of Ellis, we see on the fence along the Malcolm X schoolyard, numerous plaques with text and illustrations portraying Berkeley's history of discrimination, including redlining and other forms of housing segregation, segregation that impacted blacks, Asians, and other people of color. One plaque shares the history of the cruel internment of Japanese Americans, many of whom were US citizens during World War II. The plaques also cover other aspects of neighborhood culture such as social clubs and charm schools. Pointing out the diverse interests within the black community at the time, within several blocks of each other, there were three charm schools. In response to the times when black people were not welcome in most social settings, they created their own. For example, my parents were members of a social club that met once a month in each other's homes and had biannual formal events at venues where they were welcomed. I suppose my attending charm school was in preparation for my future social activities. 
Back at Prince and Ella Street on the southeast corner, we see this colonial revival house with lovely ornamentation. The colonial revival style was particularly popular in the early 1900s and is common in this neighborhood. After writing the Julia Street series, I began leading biannual neighborhood walks. We start on Julia Street in front of my family home and take a two mile, two hour walk, highlighting places, times and people from my books. As we are a group of about 30 people, we attract attention of homeowners and people along the way in the neighborhoods we explore. And they often come out to add their own stories to mine. For an example, a middle-aged black woman who owns one of these beautiful Victorian homes along our route shared that her home has been in her family for generations. She shared that she's saddened by the black neighbors who no longer own their homes and the changes to the culture of South Berkeley. Let's head south on Ella Street. On the left side, there's a moving Black Lives Matter sign, which incorporates the names of people killed at the hands of police and the like in the word uh, lives. We continue along Ellis and Woolsey Street, past Woolsey Street, and then at Fairview on the southeast corner is the South Berkeley Community Church from 1912, another Berkeley landmark that combines mission revival with craftsman style architecture and has an unusual corner bell tower. The church was one of the first to open to all ethnicities and was active in the civil rights movement of the 1960s. We continue on Ellis to uh, number 3219. So now you can see on the map, um, the blue dot is was our last stop and the red dot with the arrow is where we are now. And you can see that we've kind of jogged along and we've arrived at 3219 Ellis. So Mama Howard, the community activist that we talked about at the BART station, lived here with her husband Raleigh and their daughter Mildred Howard, who's shown on the, on the right side um, with her mom. She's an internationally renowned artist who's known for her sculpture in installations and mixed media assemblages. Her work has been shown at the Oakland Museum, uh, San Francisco MoMA, and in galleries around the world. She lived and worked in South Berkeley at a space out, out off of Adeline Street for decades and her struggles against gentrification were featured in a short film in 2018 called Welcome to the Neighborhood. Interestingly, I read that Raleigh and Mabel Howard were in the antiques business. Um, and if anybody knows where that, where that antique store was, I'd love to hear about that in the, um, in the chat. This area had many homes that were converted by their owners into boarding houses where black people who were new to the area stayed until they got settled, like my family did when they arrived in 1943. The boarding houses were also home to many Pullman porters who were away on the rails, often up to a month at, the, at a time. Let's turn left on the next street, Harmon, and walk one block to the commercial district at Adeline, which grew up around the Lawrence Station. Remember that we saw the Lawrence streetcar earlier. Lawrence Station was in the Lawrence district. It had its own postal designation and was not a part of Berkeley. Several buildings in this area date to the first decade of the 20th century. The former South Berkeley Bank building on the upper left on the northwest corner of Alcatraz and Adeline was designed by UC campus architect John Galen Howard in 1906. It's the city of Berkeley landmark. The Lauren, Lauren mural with a train scene in the letter L is across the street on the northeast corner of Alcatraz and Adeline. The Berkeley Ecology Center hosts a popular farmer's market here 
on the southwest corner on Tuesdays. I kind of have to chuckle to myself as I'm saying northwest and northeast, and I have absolutely no sense of direction. So um, if someone didn't show me exactly where this is on a map, I wouldn't know. <laughs> so here we are at the Lauren Theater. The Lauren Movie Theater, shown in the picture on the right, was at 3332 Adeline, just a few steps away, which showed all of the latest releases. My older siblings and their friends and kids in South Berkeley went there to see the latest movies, allegedly often using a bottle cap as price of admission. The Italian Renaissance style Lauren Theater was opened around 1910 and was designed in part by James Playcheck, who also designed the Berkeley Central Public Library and other civic spaces around town. It's a city of Berkeley landmark as well. The sign on the marquee in this picture shows a double feature with Buster Keaton starring in The Scarecrow. Since 1954, it has been the Phil Phillips Temple CME Church. Music producer Ray Dobard had his offices and recording studio in several buildings around the corner of Adeline and Ar Alcatraz. Dobard was a producer of R&B and jazz in the 1950s through the early 1970s. His Music City record store, one of a chain, was at 1866 Alcatraz. And you can see it there as it looked like in the day and then in the lower right corner um, what it looks like today. One of my fondest memories growing up is listening to the radio and learning the latest dances. My friends and I would listen to KDIA and KSOL and then go down to Music City to buy our favorite 45s. We would go back home and practice our dances. Music City had its own record label and was a major promoter of black performers. They brought a number of big names to perform in, in the Bay Area. In 1964, James Brown came to town and Adeline Street was shut down for the crowds. So now we'll walk west on Alcatraz and Tina, that's toward the Bay. <laughs> um, and see murals designed and executed by Youth Spirit Artworks, a community art program that has engaged more than 400 East Bay young people. The murals we'll see are all part of a planned Alcatraz Alley mural park, which will have 20 murals on this street and the surrounding area when it's done. Eight of them have been completed so far. And you can see here, this is the, um, the colorfully decorated YSA office on Alcatraz. Well, this, this 2017 mural is on an alley just off Alcatraz, and it was supported by, the, by Berkeley's soda tax grant program. For this mural, which is called Water is Life, YSA engaged local artists and more than 300 local, school ch local children who painted tiles which you can see on the far left, um, which pledged to reduce their consumption of sugar sweetened beverages. Another YSA mural here is called The Displacement of Beauty and the Migration of Gentrification, which was completed in 2016. And you can see me there on the lower right. And this is kind of a, a meta picture because I'm taking a picture of the um, description of the of the title of the the mural, which is in the on the right. So, and this is called "Music on Our Mind," um, which was YSA's first mural completed in two thousand nine. It features local and nationally known artists and is placed on the Bay Records building at Ellis and Alcatraz. From Ellis, we'll walk one block west toward the bay <laughs> on Alcatraz to King Street. And on the left at the southeast corner, we arrive at the Progressive Missionary Baptist Church, which was built in 1947 in the modern style. 
I was raised uh, in the Lutheran church, which meant among a lot of other things that it was um, 40 minutes in and out, very quiet service. I had friends, however, who were um, Baptist and attended Progressive Baptist Church and I would attend with them. Their service lasted typically from nine in the morning, Sunday school, through about three in the afternoon where we break and then have a meal and then start church again. So it was a full day commitment and it was compared to our quiet time in Lutheran, it was a joyful noise to the Lord. So both churches, um, the, I'm sorry, I threw myself off. Churches are important in the community. In addition to spiritual training, they taught social skills and are the keeper of the community folklore and culture. The Progressive Missionary Baptist Church has changed very little in the interior exterior over the years. Across the street is Ephesian Church on the opposite Northeast corner of King and Alcatraz, the A-frame facade of the Ephesian Church of God in Christ. My grandmother who lived with us for a while joined the Ephesian Church in the early 1940s. And they are called um, in some circles, holy rollers um, in some way, in, in some um, circles and very joyful noise to the Lord um, when we visited her church with her. On one of my neighborhood walks, a woman in her eighties shared that she had lived her whole life in South Berkeley and that she offered also that when she was a little girl, the building next to Ephesians was a Negro college. Tremaine Davis's grandfather, Bishop E.E. E. Cleveland, was minister at Ephesian when she began her singing career. At age 17, she sang with the Ed Edwin Hawkins singers on their 1966 gospel hit, Oh Happy Day. Tremaine married Edwin Hawkins' brother, Walter Lee Hawkins. Another fun fact, Lady Tremaine's first band, The Heavenly Tones, which included her friend, Vet Stone, was recruited to be backup singers with Vet's brother, Sylvester's band, Sly and the Family Stone. On the slide, we see the Edwin Hawkins singers performing Oh Happy Day in 1970 and below a Heavenly Tones singer, single produced by Ray Dobard's Music City. Using the pedestrian signal, we'll cross Alcatraz and head north on King Street going along the side of the Ephesian church. Several blocks farther along at the northwest corner with Prince and King, we arrive at the Praise Fellowship of the Church of God in Christ with an example of a residence being converted to a church or vice versa. At the pedestrian signal, we cross Ashby and proceed one block and turn left onto Julia Street, the two block street between King and Sacramento Streets and where I grew up and where my Julia Street books are based. Fifteen Eleven Julia was our family home. I have one, I'm one of three children, three girls and three boys. My father was a carpenter and built the second story of the house and the rental apartments in back himself. He said that the second story was to house his children. The apartments in back were to feed his children. I would suspect that looking back, most people believe their childhood was idyllic. And I'm convinced that mine was pretty close. I had a loving family and, and neighbors who looked out for one another and socialized together. They were regular neighborhood get, get togethers and our parents were truly good friends. Within walking distance was every service imaginable. 
a family doctor for when we were sick, a few steps down a pharmacy, Rumford's Pharmacy, to have prescriptions filled, a grocer, cleaner, shoe repair, milliner, etc., all of whom were Black. My mother often said, we have everything we need. We never really have to leave the neighborhood. Most importantly, we had role models. We had adults demonstrating through daily actions that everything and anything was possible. Almost all of the home and business owners were Black with the exception of two Japanese families on our block who were interned during the war. And after the war, they came back to reclaim their home. They were friendly, but didn't really join. So the, Janet and Bob indulged me by letting me include a few family, old family pictures. So at the top left are neighborhood children. I think those, probably must have been taken about, I don't know, 1940, maybe six or so. So in it is three of my siblings. And then to the right, the picture to the right is my father, next to him, my mother in the hat. And they seem to be at a nightclub or some sort of bar situation. Um, and then there's some other relatives with them there. And then the picture right below with my mother in front, some of my siblings, her mother, her aunt, and then you can see my father with his legs stretched out. And I always laugh because, um, you know, they're on a picnic and lucky women, they get to wear heels, nylons, and a suit to a picnic. <laughs> so let's see. Yeah, so um, I'll, Tina, I'll give you just a quick break. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah, you've been on for a while. <laughs> um, so you can see the route we've taken. Um, we've kind of from the blue dot where we were last, we, we looped back um, and then we, we went across, um, what street is, is that King? King Street. And then we made a left on Julia and walked down to Sacramento Street where the red dot is. So running down the median on Sacramento Street were Santa Fe tracks and twice daily trains. So which my brothers claim they would jump the train on Sacramento Street and ride it to school at West Campus of Berkeley High, which then was called Burbank. Allegedly, supposedly this happened. But anyway, on a train headed to UC Berkeley, then presidential candidate Bobby Kennedy made an unscheduled, at least not known to us, stop on the way to a rally at UC Berkeley. The train stopped at Sacramento and Julia Street, my street. It was amazing. The crowd grew organically. Looking back, the incongruity was plentiful. Not long after that day, the train tracks were removed. And just to note, we, we couldn't find a picture of that specific stop, but we got two other pictures of Kennedy and Berkeley, the top one um, in 1968, which probably there was that same time when he was at the Greek theater. And the lower picture was an earlier visit to Berkeley two years before that when he made a, a civil rights speech. Janet find the, found these pictures on the internet, by the way, with lots of great searching. Okay. So across the street, um, oh no, back up a little. So at the site of Robert Kennedy's unscheduled rally is a statue of William Byron Rumford, who was a pharmacist. He was the, the first black professional at Highland Hospital. And he was the first black assembly person from Northern California. Um, so there's Bob crossing the street um, and then there's the statue on the right in the median. And then across the street is uh, the location of the Rumford Pharmacy, which is a medical clinic now that, that bears his name. Um, so Rumford was a housing and civil rights activist and his key achievements were securing passage of the 1959 Fair Employment Practices Act and the 1963 
Rumford Fair Housing Act. The statue was placed here in 2016 and I think it still kind of startles a, a lot of motorists as they're going by. Across the street from the pharmacy on the, on the east side where we just came from um, is a wall of murals. On the left is Byron Rumford and the other image down below on the right shows Burt Toller Jr who was a trailblazer as the first black NFL head linesman and field judge. He was a start at the University of San Francisco and was drafted as an NFL player, but he suffered a career ending injury and then served as a referee for 25 years. He was also the first black referee to officiate at a Super Bowl game. I'm not sure if there's a Berkeley connection. I couldn't, I couldn't figure out what that is. Um, but his father uh, was a linebacker at Cal and his son, Bert Toller III, played football in Ca at Cal and is a coach there now. Just a, an aside, I, I noticed last time I went by there that there's a, a chain link fence around the whole property. So um, um, these murals might not be around for much longer, I fear. So someone in the uh, chat asked if Dana King was the artist for the uh, statue, and yes, she was. Um, so here, let's see. On Sacramento Street between Alcatraz and Russell, all of the businesses were Black owned, except King's Market, which is now called Sacramento Market. At Alcatraz in Sacramento was Dr. Sadler's office, one of the first Black dentists in Berkeley. The office is still there, run by, I think, his grandson, but it's still called Sadler's. So here we are at Reed's Records, and this is really uh, another one of my old stomping grounds, as you can imagine. Um, my mother was just a huge music fan. So from the time that we could walk, she would send us down to Reed's Records with a note uh, to for records that she would like for us to buy for her. So um, it was started in 1945 by Betty and Mel Reed. Their first store was nearby at 3107 Sacramento Street. Betty and Mel divorced and Betty remarried and took over the store in 1978 after she found Mel in a coma in back. They specialized in gospel music towards the end, they started as a full, so, a full service record store prior to, um, until Betty took it over. Betty is famous now as Betty Reed Soskin, shown on the right, the oldest living park ranger. This picture shows Reed's records, a historic plaque with her husband, Melville, Melvin Reed and Aretha Franklin. Their daughter, Dar Daria, Reed closed the store in 2019. Further down Alcatraz, continuing north towards Alcatraz, there was a pool hall and another charm school and a num number of other black owned businesses. Here we see the William Byron Rumford Senior Plaza with a mix of affordable and market rate un units at the corner of Ashby and Sacramento and the Mabel Howard Apartments for Seniors at the corner of Alcatraz in Sacramento. Also in this stretch on Sacramento Street was the original Lois the Pie Queen Cafe. The picture on the lower right shows the original location on Sacramento Street. Remember that Lois Davis is Tremaine Davis's mother. Her father was the Bishop of Ephesians Church and she got her start making pies for church fundraisers as a girl. The restaurant moved nearby to Oakland at King and Stanford Streets, where it's still serving soul food and spectacular pies today. The restaurant is run by Lois's son, Chris Davis. So, uh, the wall behind the counter of that, uh, the Oakland location is just a, a who's who of famous black Americans over the last 70 years. If you ever, you know, get to go see it, it's, it's wonderful. And I just wanted to add a, a short story that I was a, 
younger reporter at the Oakland Tribune in 1992 when uh, Jesse Jackson was running for president and they sent me to cover a speech he was giving at the AME church on Ashby and Adeline. And afterwards I went over to interview him and, and he said, hey, we're, um, you know, we're gonna go over to Lois the Pie Queen now. <laughs> and he invited me to come along. <laughs> it was, well, that's how I found out about Lois the Pie Queen. And uh, I also had the best, the absolute best piece of apple pie of, of my entire life. And I, I am a little bit of an aficionado of apple <laughs> pie. Um, it's just wonderful, kind of mind blowing, actually. <laughs> Now we walk back past Ashby to the corner of Sacramento and Oregon streets. The Spiral Gardens Community Food Security is, uh, is a security project is a nursery that has education programs and helps people grow food here or at home and sets up farmer to consumer deliveries. Spiral Gardens is located on two plots on either side of Oregon that are on the former right of way of Santa Fe Railroad which ran from Richmond along where the BART tracks are now through West Berkeley and down Sacramento Street to Oakland. The right of way cuts diagonally through the blocks from here to University Avenue. And there has long been a movement to make it a public greenway. Going north, the right of way has been used for a community garden, a restored creek as part of Strawberry Creek Park and the Ohlone Greenway west of North Berkeley BART. You can see in the left picture that Santa Fe freight trains we're still running next to BART for a short time after BART was constructed. And as we continue walking west uh, toward the bay on Oregon Street, just to the right on Door Street is Byron Rumford's home at 2776 Door Street. His original home, it's not there anymore. Uh, and so this is the, uh, another map and you can see we uh, the last stop was Sacramento and Julia and we've walked along Sacramento and turned left on Oregon Street and now we're about we're approaching San Pablo Park. Oregon Street ends at San Pablo Park. Um, it's Berkeley's oldest park. It was laid out in 1906. This is a 13 acre park that takes up about two square blocks. It's the center of a 14 square block subdivision called the San Pablo Tract. Um, many blacks and Asians who were excluded from other neighborhoods were able to buy inexpensive homes here around the Second World War with transit links to the Kaiser shipyards and other jobs. And another aside that the shipyards employed 75% of black wage earners in Berkeley, in the Berkeley area during World War II. And there was a train, uh, like a, a streetcar that went right, kind of right through the park, I, as I recall. Um, and so just to the left, as we enter the park uh, and go down a little paved path is the Francis Albreyer Community Center Francis Albreyer was the first black candidate for Berkeley City Council in 1939. In 1940, she founded the Citizens Employment Council to fight for jobs and fair employment. She was denied work at the Kaiser Shipyards and fought to become the first black woman welder, which paved the way for thousands of black women to get better jobs at the shipyards. Well, San Pablo Park is a really busy park. You can see here a playground, tennis courts, basketball, baseball, and soccer fields. Um, the Negro Baseball Leagues played here up until the 1960s. And the local team was called the Berkeley Pelicans. The Berkeley High baseball team practiced here for 100 years until they moved to a new field near, near the sports basement um, further up on Oregon Street. Um, back toward the campus um, a few years ago. On the south end of the park, we walk two blocks on Maple Street to see an historic house at 2925 Maple, which one internet site list is dating from 1910. But Berkeley Architectural Heritage says it's from the 19th century, which, with which I would recur, uh, concur from, from the style. Um, and it was quite possibly a farm 
there were a number of gentleman farms in West Berkeley set up by people from San Francisco. And this unique structure with turret represents one of the oldest houses in the neighborhood before it was subdivided. Let's return toward the park and jog left and right to stay on Mabel. At Oregon, we'll make a left. Oregon is, it continues again on the, starts up again on the other side of the park. Um, at Oregon, we'll make a left, noting as we pass around it, the Ollie Grove Baptist Church. Another example of a residence turned into a church. At Matthew Street, we'll turn right and farther along on the right side, it will be hard to miss. 2747 Matthews is called the fish house by some. More officially, Ojo del Sol, eye of the sun, but is actually patterned after a microscopic marine organism called a tardigrade. The interior rooms are curvy too. It was designed by architect Eugene Sui for his parents in 1995. He is also into futuristic clothing design, as you can see here. <laughs> <laughs> At Ward Street, let's follow Matthew Street as it jogs left and right and go one more block to Derby Street. Looking both directions up and down along the street, it is lined with ginkgo trees, which in autumn put out spectacular golden yellow leaves that stay colorful for a while on the ground like a carpet. And this should be happening sometime in the next few weeks. Go right on Derby Street. At Acton Street, we pause a moment to note that jazz saxophonist and composer Joshua Redman grew up in a bungalow a little north of here on Acton, probably one of those two pictured, and attended Berkeley High, where he was a member of the jazz ensemble, which has been a fertile training ground for musicians. Apparently, he still lives in Berkeley somewhere. A block later, we carefully cross Sacramento and continue on Derby. Directly across the street is the Longfellow School, and this section is the oldest part, designed by William Hayes in 1922. It was at one time almost entirely Black school. It is now a magnet middle school for bilingual Spanish education. In the third grade, I was transferred from Lincoln to Longfellow. Supposedly the district lines changed and so people on one side of the street on Julia kept going to Lincoln, but on my side of the street, we went to Longfellow. So, um, as I said, at that time, it was a neighborhood elementary school. It is currently a middle school. Middle school did not exist then. Um, coincidentally, all these years later as a magnet, Choice School, once again, it is largely minority, largely Hispanic and Black with only 14% white students. Continuing to California Street on the Southeast corner is the Ebenezer Evangelical Church, a congregation here since 2007, though the building is older. The Ethiopian language of Amharic mm -hmm. is used in the church and seen at the top of the sign pictured there. Um, in fact, I've seen an internet video of the minister speaking what I suppose is Amory. We turn right on California Street and one block later at Ward. Oh, you're fine, you're good. Oh, okay. Um, and this is where, showing again where we've come to. So the blue line was where we were just before we entered San Pablo Park. Uh, we've gone around um, up Derby Street to California, we've gone right one block. And at that point, on the southeast corner is the Artist Creative Hub, which opened in 2018 in a renovated former grocery store. On the Ward Street side, we photographed a Black Lives Matter memorial a few months ago, which had made, been made by the artist at the Creative Hub. Um, it, however, it seems to be gone now. This is a particularly fond memory for me. Um, the, at, it's across the street from Longfellow, where, you know, where I went to part of elementary school, and it used to be owned, it, a market, it was a market owned by an Asian family. And every morning on the way to school, we would line up two by two outside the market so that we could get our supply of penny candy for the day. 
we go left on Ward and just past McGee Avenue on the left side at 1705 Ward is a somewhat newer structure uh, attached to a large house with a gamble roof. This was initially a Japanese American Christian church and then the Revelation Missionary Baptist Church, an African American congregation, which subsequently moved to Oakland. Interestingly, the structure on the left still has, uh, or at least now, has a Japanese bell hanging down over the entranceway, which has a, a hanging Japanese textile. Um, so I, I don't know exactly what it is now, whether it's a private home or what, but it's interesting. It's, this building is back to having a Japanese ambiance again. Returning to McGee, we go left two blocks to Oregon Street. On the southwest corner is the McGee Baptist Church, a longstanding black congregation that has been very active in social work in the community. Now let's go left on Oregon Street, a little past Grant Street, turning right on the walkway next to a fence, we pass through Grove Park, an historic South Berkeley neighborhood park, which is across the street from the Torreya Hall Pittman Library. At Russell Street, we turn left and then right on MLK back to Ashby. We are now at the southwest corner of the Bart parking lot and we just cross over the parking lot back to our starting point. Sadly, this brings us to the end of our tour. Um, I want to say um, thank you to Greenbelt Alliance uh, for allowing us to use their webinar program today. Um, I'm a board member since 1992 at, at uh, Greenbelt Alliance and a long-term outings leader. And the group has been around for 16 years, 62 years, um, st started by Dorothy Erskine, who start, also started SPUR in San Francisco. And um, it's work to protect open space in the Bay Area and also to make our urban areas uh, even better places to live. And um, just now they've announced their new strategic plan, which is putting a focus um, on their mission to educate, advocate and collaborate to ensure the Bay Area's lands and communities are resilient to a changing climate. And well, this year, I think we're recognizing how important that's gonna be. Um, I think Janet had to take a call, uh, but T Tina, why don't you go ahead on your page here? Oh, sure. So first of all, I'd like to offer thanks to Path Wanderers and Bob and Janet for inviting me to tag along on their South Berkeley walk. My writing journey has given me the rare opportunity to take a long and detailed walk down memory lane in South Berkeley. It has allowed me to shine a light on a time, places and people I feel should be remembered. And I want to thank you all for joining me today and allowing me to take that walk down memory lane. If you'd like to take a closer look at Julia Street, feel free to find my books on Amazon. I think that you will find something that catches your attention and will make you feel like you are too taking that walk down memory lane. Well, Jen and I would, would like to offer our sincere gratitude to Tina. Um, and uh, we, it's been so exciting. We learned so much more about the South Berkeley neighborhood with Tina's anecdotes and contributions and, and memories. Um, I also want to mention that uh, Berkeley Pathwonders is offering a sale on signed copies of our book, Berkeley Walks for, for just $18, a real bargain price and free delivery in Berkeley, Albany, Kensington and North Oakland. Um, so you can also, uh, you could go to berkeleypaths.org to purchase. Um, if they run out of copies, you can write to Bob and Janet at info at berkeleywalks.com. And Janet, I'm glad to see you back. Did you have another yeah. word to answer, to, to add? I just, uh, my husband's doing great. Yay. I just the doctor. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, yeah. So I just really wanna thank Tina and it was so much fun working with you, you know, doing this tour with you. Uh, just just such a, such a pleasure. Um, I hope we can do it again. And I also just, I wanna thank Alina for being such a, um, such a badass. <laughs> <laughs> as our as our president i really i appreciate you so much we all do now thank you to the three of you for this great tour um 
I mean, our usual, the annual meeting is usually at the Hillside Club. We have snacks, we socialize. I, dare I say that this was better? I, <laughs> um, honestly, it offered people a chance to, to join from far away to, you know, we'll post it as a recording. I, I think it turned out fabulous and uh, wonderful stories from Tina. I, I love hearing them, so. Great. Yeah, if, if great anyone wants to, Oh, sorry. If anybody wants to raise their hand, we can, I can turn. Oh yeah, we can include you all in the discussion. <laughs> yeah, we have a few minutes. Let me, um, let me show the panelists. Yeah, if anyone wants to raise their hand. Oh, I see one person, um, Elaine Byron. Who is that? You're welcome to talk. <laughs> Hi, I'm Janet's mom. <laughs> um, I'm in New York, and I've been following the um, Janet and Bob's walks. Oh, why is my picture not showing up? It's it's a <laughs> webinar. Oh, you can. Oh, okay. Anyway, I, can hear you, but we can. I just wanted to tell Tina, and I, Tina, I loved your commentaries, but Janet has Janet's daughter, who's now seventeen, um, is named Julia. Oh, and, yes. <laughs> she, she's named after my late husband, Jules. But uh -huh. when she had a bat mitzvah four years ago, Janet sent me out to photograph the corner of Julia Street. Oh, and my California. goodness. And we <laughs> sent out an invitation to the bat mitzvah with the picture of Julia Street. Oh, that's great. <laughs> And I thought you might be interested to hear that. That is so great. Thank you for sharing that. <laughs> Maybe. That is great. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, so Tommy, um, Tommy. I'm here. You're welcome to talk, Tommy. Okay. Hey, Tina, Weena, how you doing? Hey, Tommy McRae. <laughs> I did, of course, I enjoyed the show. Of course, everything you went through was my neighborhood. So what can I say? <laughs> but oh, <laughs> I was just wondering, and we would probably have to get a committee together. Um, the tour that you did of what are the, what are we calling this now? South Berkeley. <laughs> if we could, I, hey, you know, when I grew up, we didn't have all these different neighborhoods. So if we could maybe do a similar tour for the front. And maybe North Berkeley oh. or something like that. I think that would be a really good idea. So that's just a thought. I'll throw that so out. So Tommy, Tommy, what is what's considered the front? Anything below San Pablo. Uh, oh, okay. Front, okay. Starting from about Gilman. Gilman, San Pablo, going down. Um, I'm going to say probably at least to Dwight Way, maybe. You know, that would be really interesting because the culture has completely changed with that shopping area and all that there now, right? Yeah, and down on uh, Fifth Street, Fourth yeah. Street, there was absolutely nothing down there when we were growing up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be great. Well, let's let's talk about it. Okay. I'm I'm going to lower my hand and get out of here now. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Um, we we can take more. If anyone else wants to raise your hand, we'd be Wait, happy to hear. Did you check the Q and A, Janet? Oh, the Q and A. Let's see. Um, yeah, answered. Open. Pear said, "Great to be with you from Sweden." Ron said, "Do you know that Berkeley is installing a handrail on Oak Ridge Path?" Um, oh, and I should also note someone Great. said in the chat that Bert. Toller owned that property where the mural is. Oh. So yeah, I, I couldn't find anything like you know that connected him to Berkeley, but he, he apparently he lived nearby. So and he owned he owned that property. That someone um let's see who said that. Uh, Thank you for all your wonderful comments in the chat. Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, should yeah, I start? Yeah, Reed's was in business for over 75 years. Yeah, that's right. Oh, Joan, would you like to talk? And Sandra, you're up next. 
So my question is this. I have a past map from 2002, and I'm wondering if there's a, an updated version available. Well, our, our most recent map is from 2018, I believe. And since oh, okay. very good. Path, Thank you so much. You they keep getting better because finish. there's more and more paths that are That's available. Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. Well, I've got to be current. Thank you so it's much. It's the best map. It's not only the be the past map, it's the best map of Berkeley period. <laughs> yeah, but we have we have a new map, a new edition in the works. Oh. Yeah, when will that when will that come this out? Is, this is know? like the computer companies. You're using planned obsolescence, so we have to keep upgrading. <laughs> um, and then Sandra. Hi. Um, so Tina, you mentioned that you also give tours in addition to your books. How do we get information about that? Well, um, when we're not in COVID, right, um, I've done biannual, usually May and September, <clears throat> walks that um, are a couple of hours, two miles. Um, so in answer to your question, if you could send me an email, I'll add you to the mailing list. Okay. And I will give you my email address. Do you, okay. are you ready you. to take it? It's WTINA, T-I-N-A, 791 at AOL.com. Great. Thank you. Thank you. I'd love to have you um, so, okay. as soon as we're out. Of right. Okay. <laughs> well, I think I'm going to stop the recording now. That's okay with everybody. Did we get all the questions, Q&A? Yes. Is there any more questions? Nobody made any bad comments about us.